to prototyping AI ethics future with the Just AI Network. This event is kindly co-hosted today with the British Academy, Arts and, Arts and Humanity Research Council and the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, I want to start off this introduction um, by signaling that we have closed captions available and you can find the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom window or alternatively you can find the stream text link that is located in the chat and this, this, the stream text link provides a more efficient delivery of real-time text opposed to the Zoom platform. Okay, um, my name is Louise Hickman. I am a senior researcher with the Just AI Network. I am delighted to be having this panel today with all these wonderful people that we will soon introduce. Um, but what I want to do is just give briefly a um, kind of um, background information on the panel and how we came here today. Um, I have been working with Alexa and we have been running together a working group on rights, access and refusal. And in this um, working group, we have been working with two um, PhD students, um, Clarice and Harsha, who um, Alexa will introduce briefly in a bit. And we have been working together in ways that we've been thinking about access to VR technology and how perhaps we can think about access to VR technology as a visually impaired person and thinking through providing access in these settings using co-authorship. And I think something maybe Mara can pick up uh, later on um, is thinking about quick co-authorship and um, that's something that could be really interesting in thinking about what this means for access and refusal. So, and um, to take a step back before we um, introduce the panelists for today's discussion and the respondent, Sarah, um, I just want to kind of give a kind of broader kind of outline of the Just AI project. Um, we have been working as a team for the last year um, to bring together, um, well, we kind of needing network prototype as a way, as a, as a methodology to think about what it means to bring people together. We often speak about bringing multiple stakeholders together, but when we say that, what we actually mean by stakeholders is people and their lived experience. I want to um, quickly echo um, a comment that Edward Harcourt, the director of AHRC, made on Monday when he we kind of introduced the um, the week that we're currently in the middle of, is thinking about um, what does ethics mean and how we need the label of ethics and how those labels or don't really often apply to um, real life and li lived experience. So. I really hope today's conversation, we're going to really move beyond these kind of labels and really think about how we understand text in our everyday life and the possibility of refusing as well. So how can we exist outside the systems? And when, when we ask these questions about refusal, we're also asking who has the option to refuse who can take those risks. Another point that I really want to like draw on in the kind of launch on Monday, which I really think makes sense for today's discussion, is really thinking about networking and thinking how we convene people in these conversations is a type of methodology. And so I think this is a really useful kind of way to think about, especially the scholars and researchers we have today, is thinking about what type of methods we use. In this 
project reviews, um, literature mapping, design methodology, and so forth. And but in thinking about these um, methodologies, we have kind of used fiction as a way to as a knowledge maker, a, a way to make knowledge. And um, the scholars in critical disability studies often write about and these being Alison Taper, Amy Hembray, and they talk in their work, they talk about designing for people with disability frictionless future. So the idea that technology comes in and serves as a function as a, to write disability out of the future of design and technology. So in thinking about fiction and thinking how this is relevant to everyone's work today, I think it's really kind of exciting to really think about what, what exciting perhaps the wrong word, but refusal. Like again, who can take that risk and how do we do that in our collective work? So um I will um briefly um close out this kind of introduction of the Just AI project and how this panel came into formation, I just quickly want to signal that tomorrow at the same time, 1pm, we have the Just AI Fellows, which is Sarah is included in this cohort, who will be presenting um, their work from the last six months on the racial justice uh, panel. So I think Hannah will um, put this into the chat box so you can find, um, or maybe you already have. Um, so this will be tomorrow and I encourage you to sign up for it. And now I'm going to hand it over to Alexa. Hello, it's such a pleasure to be part of this week's amazing event. Uh, I see that Hannah just put a link for Monday's opening event in the chat, and I really encourage people to watch that if you didn't have the chance. It was really powerful. Um, so I'm Alexa Haggerty, as Louise said. It's my great uh, pleasure and honor to be co-convening this group with Louise. Um, this working group. I am an anthropologist. I'm based at the University of Cambridge at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. And I get to introduce this absolutely wonderful panel, which I'm going to do without delay because we have so much to talk about and not that much time. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Taylor, a sociologist at the Center for Human-Centered Interaction Design at City University of London. With a fascination for the entanglements between social life and machines, his research ranges from empirical studies of technology and everyday life to speculative design interventions. He draws on feminist technoscience to ask questions about the roles human-machine composites play in forms of knowing and being and how they open up possibilities for fundamental transformations in society. Crystal Lee is a PhD candidate at MIT and a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. She works broadly on topics related to the social and political dimensions of computing, data visualization, and disability. She also conducts ethnographic and computational research on social media communities. Crystal's research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the MIT Program for the Digital Humanities. Previously, she was a visiting research scientist at the European Commission. Mara Mills is Associate Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University, where she co-founded and co-directs the NYU Center for Disability Studies. She is also founding editor of the journal Catalyst, Feminism, Theory, Technoscience, winner of the 2020 4S STS Infrastructure Award. Mara works at the intersection of sound studies and disability studies. Most recently, she co-edited the book Testing Hearing, The Making of Modern Orality. Her public arts and humanities writings can be found at sites including Triple Canopy, Art Forum, Public Books, Somatosphere, and Avidly, which is a channel of the Los Angeles Review of Books. 
Our respondent today is Sarah Chander, a Just AI Racial Justice Fellow. And again, there's a link to the event tomorrow um, in, in our chat. Uh, and uh, Sarah's project explores how to develop a truly racial justice oriented approach to AI policy. She's also senior policy advisor at the European Digital Rights in, in Brussels, and she has a background in racial justice, queer liberation, and anti-immigration detention. She's interested in the radical power of refusal. So I'm going to um, pass back to Louise to begin our self-descriptions. Thank you. Um, I am a white person wearing headphones. I have a fringe that is slightly too short and uh, maybe misplaced at the moment. And I have a purple dress, which was supposed to be a yellow jumper to go with it to um, symbolize the colors of the Just AI project. And I have Alison's office in the background with some drawings. And now I will pass this over to Alex. Hi, thanks, Louise. Um, I am of mixed Asian Chinese descent and I identify as he, him. Um, I think Crystal's next. I'm an East Asian woman with bangs and a um, blue black shirt, and um, I'm in an overlit room. Uh, and with that, I'll go to Mara. Hi, I'm Mara. I'm a middle-aged white woman with a brown messy bun <laughs> from getting up early. I'm sitting in a hotel room in Texas um, with a uh, so I'm not in my native habitat of New York, which has, it has a tiny apartment with blank white walls. I'm in a room that's bigger than my apartment <laughs> um, with sort of wooden um, shades on the windows and, and white brick walls. And I go by she, her. Um, let me pass it to Sarah. I use she, her. I'm the descendant of Dalit Indian immigrants to the UK. And I'm coming to the session today very tired, but very exhausted from conversations about legislation uh, divorced from their impacts on real people. I am Alexa. My pronouns are she, her. I am a middle-aged white woman sitting with a blurred background <laughs> and wearing a gray sweater and a black top. So we're going to um, kick off our presentations, um, beginning with Alex. Thank, thank you, Alexa. Um, I just wanted to start by saying what an honor it is to, to share the floor or, or maybe share a platform. Um, we have to change that these days um, with such thoughtful scholars and people that um, I've been thinking with. So it's nice to actually see them, if not be with them um, in person. So um, I wanted to take the opportunity today to do, um, to think with some new ideas in a sense for me. Um, and, and specifically, I want to discuss the grounds on which we think about access and disability. And, and that, that notion of the grounds is going to be something I'm gonna try and come back to um, during today's panel and, and in this short 10 minute talk. Um, but before I get to the grounds, I want to think, um, take a step back and start with the impulse that seems to pervade uh, the thinking in te technology circles. And that's the impulse to find problems to solve. And I think many of us are kind of familiar with that rhetoric within engineering and technology, um, that technology is all about um, solutions to problems. And I think that you know, as much as we try and resist that, I think it really still does pervade an engineering and, and mentality around um, technology, but also in particular um, AI. So I just wanted to talk briefly about my own experience there. Um, I have worked at, um, in, a big, in two big technology companies during my career. I worked at Xerox very early on in my career and just recently, I worked for Microsoft for about 13 years in Microsoft research. And so I've encountered this sort of, um, if you like, this impulse to be driven by um, finding solutions. Um, and this is particularly the case in, for example, computer vision and AI systems, 
for the blind and vision impaired. And so quite often um, you'll see um, computer vision being promoted as a way in which um, we might solve the problem of sight impairment or vision impairment. And to me, and I think probably many others on this call, that's a real front, an, an affront to, to ideas of disability, that somehow we might solve the absence of something like vision. Um, and so you know, much of my own work has been in, if you like, resistance to or refusal to that kind of dialogue in which we're somehow solving the absence of something. And of course, that absence might also be something like hearing, etc. And, so, and I think many other people on the call will be familiar with that sort of rhetoric. So um, just to sort of set the stage, if you like, I want to invite a, a resistance or a refusal to the idea of solving the problem of disability. Um, that, that's been a sort of, if you like, a key feature in, this, in my work in this space. So I'm, I'm particularly inspired by the thinking of um, disability and critical disability studies scholars. So friends like Cindy Bennett, um, scholars like Christine Kelly and Alison Kaffer, and, and also um, people like Mara, who's here on the call. Um, so for me, what's interesting potentially in this space is the idea of um, a refusal from the ground up. And that, that is to mean um, that we might um, refuse the way in which the, the problems get framed and the way in which solutions get approached to those problems. And as I said, the idea of um, refusing to see sight loss as a problem is sort of a first step in that, in that sort of thinking. Um, uh, that, this kind of orientation for me has come from close, um, a close collaboration with Cindy Bennett, who is blind herself, and both she and I have been working to think about things like access and disability through AI technologies. I know Cindy in particular is, um, raises a lot of questions about the role of AI in supporting the, um, the blind and vision impaired. What I, what I wanted to just touch on, and I'm not, I didn't want to show this as a slide or anything. I'm going to actually paste the link um, into the chat, I hope this works, um, to a project that um, Cindy and I were sort of tangentially involved in, and I've been involved in since trying to um, analyze the outcomes of some of the work. This is a project um, that began with a very close partnership with a young, a young boy, um, I'll call him TH, um, for the purposes of this call. I think his name might actually be on the link that, I, that I've shared with you. Um, but TH um, and a team at Microsoft uh, worked collaboratively for about three or four years um, building a system that enables um, him to identify people in his social space, if you like, his social geography. Um, and I, I think it, this is a really interesting example. I'm still not clear of how it, how it kind of fits into this model of solutionism that we might sort of be critical of, but I think it opens up a space for quite a different sort of thinking about what AI might do for people. And so the idea here is, is not to solve or replace um, what we might see as a, a lack of ability on TH's part. It's, it's in a sense to enable him to engage with the world differently. And um, the, the results of the um, ethnographic analysis that I've been conducting really show a very different orientation to the world on TH's part and his family's part. And so you see this really interesting kind of what um, Cindy and I have called interdependence between both TH and his family and the technologies all coming together to kind of reshape the ways in which people are orienting to the world. Um, and I think this, for me, um, if you like, is an example of this thinking about um, this, what we're doing around access and, and disability from the ground up, that we're actually trying to sort of, if you like, change something at ground level that then might help us reconceptualize the space for disability. Alexa, can you let me know when I'm sort of, um, nearing my time so I don't want to don't want to overrun. Yes you have about three more minutes. Okay so um, what I want to do in closing is sort of put put forward a, a sort of different way of thinking about this. Um, so I want to ask I suppose 
Um, this is something I asked myself, and maybe this is something I pose to the panel and to the audience, and that is, um, what might it be to refuse the grounds altogether? And so thus far, I think we've been sort of refusing a particular orientation, the, 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 the pairing of the solution and the problem. What my question now is, um, what might it be to refuse the grounds altogether? And I think Louise's sort of provocation at the beginning, how do we exist outside the systems, might also sort of have some kind of parallel to this. Um, and when I invite that question, I'm drawing on scholarship in Black and Indigenous studies, um, scholars like Sadia Hartman, Calvin Warren, and Audra Simpson, um, where they have deep and fundamental questions about the actual ontological basis on which we consider the being of the human. Um, and Calvin Warren in particular talks about, for example, an ontological terror in which we might really have to ask ourselves, what is the human? within the ontologies we operate in. What Calvin Warren invites then is a radically different understanding of our existences in the world. Um, and he resists the, you know, the very fundamental notions of ontology um, that philosophy and metaphysics are orient to. Um, this um, is a terror because of course, so much is founded on our idea of being human. When you start to unpack and unravel the question of what it is to be human, then the question becomes what, what is left? Um, and um, Calvin Warren in particular is talking about blackness and questions of race. And of course, these, these issues run very deeply. Um, Calvin Warren refers to, for example, Black Lives Matter and assumes that it uh, relies on an ontological ground that puts blackness and nothingness together. And that's what he wants to resist. Um, so what happens when the grounds are refused? Well, we might say um, the worlds in which the grounds are defined already structure our thinking about what bodies are and what they are capable of. And that again is what I invite a resistance or a refusal to. And that, I, that question of capability or capacity is a question I want to push back on. Um, Warren talks about this as a circuit of misery, that the very language that we have to talk about for example, race and blackness, or we might say disability and ability, reinforces a sense of um, difference, differentness and separation. Um, so I invite us, as Warren speaks um, to this theme, to reject the terms through which we organize our existence and to ask what kinds of existences do we want to live with and in. Um, and I want to refuse um, those uh, questions that demand of us the separation between um, how we understand ability and disability today. Um, just as a very brief example, when I talk about refusal here, refusal could be, for example, through modes of fiction that um, Louise introduced earlier, but it, it is also, I think, through methods. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the way Audra Simpson talks about an ethnographic refusal. So how, what kinds of methods might we start to adopt that enable us to refuse um, in a critical and scholarly way? Lastly, um, for, for artificial intelligence or AI, I think the question is whether this sense of refusal um, of the grounds altogether might give us something, um, whether AI might give us something to work with in this space. Thus far, I think AI certainly fits into our sort of ordinary nomenclature of thinking about ability and disability. Um, and I'd like to think, well, what, what does AI potentially open up for us? Uh, what are the grounds by which we might think differently? Um, and as Warren in invites us to do radically different ways of organizing our existence. Um, so I'd like to leave it there. Um, I, Alexa, I'm not sure if you want to introduce Crystal or... Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, Crystal, you are up, up next. I'm already excited for our questions. So by the way, everyone, please uh, feel free to add your questions as speakers are, um, are uh, speaking in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So Crystal, passing to you. Okay, 
Wait, let me see if... Okay, I'm just gonna leave it like this so that I can still see everyone. Um, so I really want to take up um, Alex's provocation to kind of think about refusing the grounds to kind of think about what that looks like day to day. So as a grad student, I feel like this is the kind of compelling question that like throw, um, goes through my mind every day when I go into a computer science lab, which is like, even if I convince the engineering grad student in the lab next to me that I should think that they should think about disability, that access as a process is important, um, that their technology that they've been building with their PI is oppressive. Like, what does this grad student then do when they go into the lab tomorrow? And I think that to me is an interesting microcosm of thinking about who gets to refuse technology, because it kind of gets at this larger question of um, not only the kind of bodies that are valued, um, and the kinds of participation that are valued in the technologies that we're talking about, but also the kind of invisible labor that um, supports um, the design and infrastructure. So to kind of get to this question of who gets to refuse technology and how, um, I think a lot of the guiding principles um, that I've been thinking about um, like stem from the Feminist Manifesto, which I'm sure many people in this call have um, read, uh, but also this like larger swath of human computer interaction and design scholarship that talks about anti-racist and intersectional non-intervention. And Alex is of course one of the main people that I've been thinking with um, here. But I mean, in terms of like thinking about compelling templates of action, I think obviously there's a way for us to disaggregate between individual and collective approaches, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But I think another kind of specter that really helps contextualize a lot of this conversation for me is thinking about how technology both under promises and over promises in terms of the types of um, changes that um, they can bring about. So I think uh, in terms of a lot of these techno-determinist narratives, they under-promise insofar as, or, or they over-promise, sorry, I'll start there, um, insofar as like, you know, they paint some vision where like disability can be erased, uh, where um, policing can be like perfectly objective, that like, you know, you can erase bias and like enforce fairness. I think there are these like large promises that we just have never seen actually fulfilled. Um, at the same time, by like trying to over optimize the status quo or otherwise, but um, yeah, by trying to over optimize the status quo, um, these kind of technological narratives under promise insofar as um, they refuse or like uh, sideline the opportunity to radically reimagine social relations and the way that we value um, different kinds of participation or bodies within um, these technological systems. And so like thinking about this tension of like over promising and under promising in, within this like larger constellation of refusing technology for me has been really evocative. But in order to kind of like uh, transcend this double bind, I think um, being able uh, to get scholars and engineers and uh, practitioners to really learn from disabilities to think about access as a process rather than as a matter of compliance and building that within um, the design process is, a, is I think the first step towards, uh, as Alex says, refusing the grounds. Um, so when we're trying to refuse to build or use these technologies to kind of push the questions a little bit forward. Um, I'm thinking of two main ones, like can you afford to opt out of these technologies? Like I'll use Facebook and Google as main examples. Like, do you have the time, resources and effort to be able to maintain this like completely separate search infrastructure? Or do you have the expertise or privilege to navigate these processes? Um, so, I mean, I think in some cases it feels pretty impossible, especially with um, the prevalence of CCTV. So can you opt out of taking a walk in the park? Um, or do you have the expertise to refuse certain kinds of inspection at the airport? Or for example, um, more recently, I've had some like really unsavory internet experiences and wanted to opt out of all of the systems, um, particularly in the US that aggregate my personal address and cell phone number and all of these different things and actually trying to like opt out of having my personal information shared uh, 
took consulting with multiple lawyers <laughs> and like uh who are friends and like were able to help me but i don't think that most people who are harassed on the internet have such a privilege. Um, but beyond that, I think there's a kind of double bind of um, participation in design in the sense that people of color, disabled folks, multiply marginalized people like might reasonably opt out of training a surveillance system, for example, or any other like AI system, um, like the ones that Alex talked about. Um, but what are the consequences of opting out? Um, often that means that um, these people are never represented, um, but also opting in often means that like they're making a system more precise at targeting them. And so I think in that case, it's it can be difficult to move beyond these tensions. Um, so in terms of like structuring the conversation about refusal a little further, um, and I'll try to speed through this, uh, I am drawing particularly on uh, the work of Jonathan Zong and uh, Nate Matias, where they really kind of triangulate these different dimensions of refusal. So they think about autonomy, power, and time. So in terms of autonomy, I think this is where the question of the individual and the collective really come to the fore. So is it about like the aggregate uses of data in society, or is it about individual decisions um, about data that affect multiple individuals? Um, as I alluded to earlier, there are lots of different um, power structures that limit um, people, uh, the ability of people to refuse technology, either in terms of building it or in terms of using it. Um, and there's a longer time scale of thinking about when to refuse. So is it when you say do not accept cookies or is it about a, like, a longer proactive uh, approach to redressing harm? But there too are like lots of different forms of like refusing ableist forms of technology. Um, so um, there are four different rough categories that uh, they've put together. So for example, like if we're talking about collective action by affected communities, are we talking about class action lawsuits or government legislation? We're talking about expertise to facilitate refusal. Is it about expert testimony, education, advocacy, like this kind of scholarship that people use on um, from the people in this call to try to facilitate ways for people to think about disability and um, refusing technology such that people can actually do it uh, in the future. Um, there are also everyday acts of refusal. I think my favorite one is digital homesteading um, or sharing Netflix passwords as a kind of everyday form of resistance um, or like even uh, larger community-led forms like um, audit studies or bypassing publisher paywalls. There's there's a larger article um, about this, which I'll put in the chat that has been really helpful for me to think about. Um, how am I on time, Alexa? You're doing great. You have like two more minutes, so. Great, two more minutes, two more slides. Um, so I think to kind of tie all of this back uh, to disability and technology, I wanna draw a little bit on Ashley Shu's work just so we have a kind of like shared vocabulary in the discussion. Um, and I think so one of the things that she's really um, like honed in me is this idea of techno-ableism. So the narratives that about technology and disability that reinforce ableism, like usually by fixing people with technology. And I mean, I think techno-ableism comes about in many forms, and I think Alex has um, articulated a lot of them really clearly. Um, and I think this, uh, the way that this narrative often gets invoked when it comes to disabled folks often uh, comes in the form of all of these different tropes, like moochers and fakers or inspirational overcomers, like, you know, the people who overcome disability through technology. But ultimately, I think these narratives about the purported users and the assumed designers often re-entrench these ableist and racialized and gendered ideas about who gets to access technology, um, either as users or makers and um, populations impacted by their use. So the entire cycle and infrastructure of people who um, like get affected by these technologies. Um, and so, in terms of thinking towards the future to like refusing to build and use oppressive technology, I mean, I think certainly um, 
this is where I like get really interested in hearing uh, from the other panelists because I think that there is like the kind of bare minimum that often isn't met, which is listening to disabled experience and refusing these ableist narratives, um, investigating and thinking about what um, internalized ableism looks like for ourselves. Like I think these are things that are kind of like low hanging fruit, uh, but if we're talking um, more broadly, like I think often there can be a misguided impetus to use engineering education as an individual fix. So like if people just knew that they needed to um, like refuse ableist narratives or like if they had just read disability studies, like maybe they would be better. Um, I don't know that that is enough. I think it's, um, and I am trying to think beyond this kind of individual fix towards collective refusal. Um, so like relying on a lot of the work that I've just talked about. Um, but ultimately, I, I think the question that I want to um, talk about moving forward in this panel is who gets to participate and whose participation is valid. Um, and here I'm really thinking about Dee Wu's work on disabled folks training Chinese AI systems and Liz Jackson's work on disability dongles. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those more, but I hope that the, this broad swath of resources is helpful for other people um, to try to move forward on a lot of these issues. Mara. Thank you, Crystal. Um, that was terrific. And um, I feel so lucky to get to go after these two talks. You both have um, just set up so many of the topics and themes that are on my mind too. And I'll start by taking us sort of back, in a way backward in time with an analog example that I digitized and that then presented a whole series of questions for me about refusal across analog and digital platforms. Um, so I was really excited at, and it was so fortuitous to get this invitation from Louise to talk about technology refusal because you know, I just donated a historical collection to the Lesbian History Archives in Brooklyn a couple of weeks ago when New York City began to reopen. And this collection specifically um, cre you know, generated all sorts of questions for me ab about refusal um, and, and about refusing the historian's um, reading and not just um, as a form of, of refusal, refusing um, to be collected, refusing something refusing to be read. So I'll start by just telling you a little bit about the collection and then I'll end with giving you some of my thoughts and some theories of others about um, refusal and non-use, again, sort of both analog and digital at the same time. So the collection is a set of several hundred four track tapes, which is a, a, a rare and obsolete format um, that I digitized with my RA Shafika Hashash. And the tapes were originally commissioned by a feminist disability activist group, um, the Women's Braille Press. Women spelled with a Y for medium specific reasons, as well as the obvious political ones. Um, one of the founders told me that um, the spelling with the Y is more aesthetically pleasing in Braille. So the Women's Real Press Collective was organized in 1980 by six blind women in Minneapolis to publish Braille and audio versions of feminist poetry and memoir, all of the feminist serials that were being published then, things like Off Our Backs and Sojourner and Sinister Wisdom, health pamphlets, programs for LGBT events, you name it. Um, in the 14 years before this collective disbanded, volunteers recorded over 800 cassette books for them, mostly in English, but also in Spanish and German. And many feminist authors, um, including Opal Palmer Adisa, Judy Free Spirit, um, who was the author of Fat Liberation Manifesto, Juana Maria Paz, um, they read their own works aloud for this group. Um, the Women's Braille Press also published a quarterly newsletter with book reviews, health resources, calls to activism, very detailed accessibility guidelines for feminist events, and also um, very detailed personal ads, which poses a whole other set of privacy issues around digitization. Um, by 1990, the collective claimed that their newsletter that had subscribers in six countries and here's a quote from one of their um, publications, was the longest lived publication by, for, and about disabled women, and one of only a handful of publications produced in braille, in print, and on tape. Um, and over time, the, the efforts of this activist group resulted in a really unusual media access coalition that spanned um, many different disabilities, not just blindness. Um, the constituency um, grew to include subscribers, 
with learning disabilities, cerebral palsy, um, multiple sclerosis, reading epilepsy, ink allergies, and, and a whole range of other impairments. Um, they also, ex despite the um, lesbian separatism that you might hear in, in their name, they, um, they also expanded to include trans members, which was relatively unusual um, at that time period. Um, they also coined and popularized the phrase print disability um, in, in English in the early 1980s. They first published that phrase in a letter to the editors of Off Our Backs. Um, pr print handicaps was a library phrase that was always already used, but they changed it to print disability for activist reasons. And I think this phrase print disability takes the social model of disability to um, its logical conclusion. You know, it's a category of disability based on the built environment specifically media rather than on physiology. So the cassette tapes themselves, you know, it was a cassette tape collective. They were circulated by mail to subscribers who paid a sliding fee, um, $25 a year if your income was over $15,000 a year. And they also circulated their catalogs in large print and audio and braille. Um, when they disbanded in 1994, um, they sent all 800 of their um, books, which was like thousands and thousands of tapes, to the, um, the Bureau of Braille and Talking Book Services in Daytona Beach, Florida, which is part of the US National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped or the, what's known as the NLS. It's a branch of the Library of Congress. And since that time, only participants in the NLS program, which was like a more restricted group than the original Women's Braille Press subscriber list. Um, so only NLS subscribers have been able to check the books out. And to be an NLS subscriber, you have to have a medical certification or a paramedical certification of blindness or another print disability um, to avoid the payment of copyright fees to the book publishers. So by the time I learned about the Women's Braille Press, like eight years ago, 200 of the tapes listed in the catalog had already been deaccessioned. This is like a library term for being thrown away um, as a result, of, supposedly, of material deterioration. And then the remaining 600 were located in off-site storage and they weren't circulating at all. And they were about to be deaccessioned because they were recorded in this now obsolete NLS four track format that played at half the speeds of commercial tapes. There's two separate tracks per side on what's known as a C1 tape playback machine, which the Library of Congress had gotten rid of and converted to digital and they, the tapes weren't being converted. Um, just as an aside, there's a, <laughs> I was surprised to see that there's in the eight years that I've been working on this, there's now a cited um, ambient music subculture sprung up around making music with the C1 machines. Um, they're very hard to come by, and, but they had these early, this early time stretching capability that people love the sound of. So I worked for about two years with an NYU master's student, Shafika Hashash, who's a subscriber to the NLS and a, a member of the National Federation of the Blind, to try to save this example of blind activism from being systematically destroyed by the National Library System. Um, and through her own NLS contacts and like months of persistent phone calls and email messages, Shafika convinced the Florida librarian to locate and mail the thousands of tapes um, to us at NYU. But at that point, this is like a year or two in, that's where our actual problems with how to um, preserve and then make available this collection began. So we played some of the tapes on a, a C1 machine that I have in my office when they came in. So things like, if you know the, if you know um, the literature of lesbian separatism, um, Dykes Loving Dykes, Dyke Separatist Politics for Lesbians Only. This was a book by Bev Joe, um, Linda Strega, and Rustin. Um, another like think, uh, Fragments from Lesbos, a book of poetry by Alana Dyke Woman, who was the editor of Sinister Wisdom for many years. So we played a few of these and we found that all of the cassette tapes open with or verbal um, injunctions, several of them in a row. So solely for the use of the blind was one. This is a, a quote that's typical for the NLS, but then also ones that they added. So they were for blind and print disabled women only. And then some of the books were also for lesbians only or for blind lesbians only. And now I, I'm a lesbian, Shafika's blind. Neither of us fell into the category of blind lesbians. And we started to ask ourselves, should we keep listening? What does separatism um, mean um, today when a lot of those groups have disbanded? Um, you know, the Women's Braille Press wasn't itself a separatist group. So many of the members were feminists and in fact, not lesbians. 
but all of the tapes even now are still restricted by copyright law to blind readers. And then, like I said, some of the tapes are additionally restricted by the separatist warning. And that, that warning was also found on the original print versions. Um, so, you know, can I, can I listen to it as a historian, as a cited dyke loving dyke? Can I listen to it? Can I write about it? W where should we put it after we digitize it? Who can listen to it? Where should it be held? C can clips be put online? Um, you know, as a sound historian working on digital preservation, I, you know, it, it also raised this question to me of what separatism means in the context of digital networked media that would are that are so marked by the ideology of universal communication. It's a it's very different um, than the print culture and cassette collective um, mode of of communicating. So we tracked down, there were, there's two living founders of the Women's Braille Press. Um, we tracked them down. One is Marge Schneider, and, and she recommended that we donate the tapes to the Lesbian Herstory Archives, which we did after we digitized them. It was super expensive to digitize them, and we wrote a grant and, and did that. Um, uh, the Lesbian Herstory Archives holds a number of separatist collections in their basement, so uh, including many other categories of separatism beyond lesbianism, things like BDSM separatism. So we just transferred the tapes to them and we're essentially just letting the Herstory Archives make decisions about access going forward. And I have an article I've written about this group that I've never published and I don't know if I will. I'm not sure how to move forward with publishing it. Um, so, but this is a bit of a side note. What I wanna take from this case is that for our talk today is that our conversation, I mean, is that this raises a lot of interesting points to me about technology use, non-use and refusal. So, you know, in disability studies, we know that most refusal by disabled people is stigmatized as non, this word non-compliance. Um, Crystal mentioned it too. This is a very patronizing medical term with often very punitive con consequences and permanent consequences. It gets NP, gets if you ever see NP in your medical file, that's not a good thing. It can follow you forever um, for those who like don't follow doctor's orders. Um, you know, on the other hand, regarding assistive technology, and I put that phrase in huge quotes, since we know from Catherine Ott that all technology is assistive, there are high rates of refusal for slash quote non-compliance for a variety of really good reasons, <laughs> ranging from lack of involvement of disabled users in prototyping and testing processes, um, to stigmatizing or unwieldy or outmoded design, to lack of training, I mean, technology doesn't act on its own, lack of money, to lack of interoperability with other systems, and the list goes on and on for why one would, why it makes sense for there to be refusal. Um, and more broadly, you know, all technology has its refusers or non-users, as we've, as we've heard from Alex and Crystal, um, although non-users don't often get featured as actors in our science and technology studies narratives, that's STS is the field I was trained in. Um, Sally Wyatt, who's an STS, has identified four general categories of non-user, and I'll just add these terms to the um, uh, great categories of refusal that Crystal shared with us. So she talks about resistors, people who choose never to use a technology, rejectors, people who stop using a technology voluntarily, Ref you know, both of those are types of refusal, the expelled, people who are forced to stop using a technology after using it, and then the excluded, those without access for a whole variety of social and technical reasons. Um, and then in terms of use itself, why it argues, and it's good to just remember, because this also doesn't always come up in our stories about technology, that it's often forced, reluctant, or partial. Um, <clears throat> it's not often like some wholehearted, um, you know, adoption. <laughs> So for the Women's Braille Press, exclusion was certainly um, one aspect of, of non-use, right? So to be print disabled um, um, was about exclusion. But for this particular group, being print disabled, um, they thought of it as a double disability. So exclusion from print at an earlier moment in the US meant exclusion from mainstream print culture, mainstream schooling. But even after the founding of Braille and Talking Book Collections, at the Library of Congress, print disability um, for the Women's Braille Press members meant exclusion from the feminist counter public because the Library of Congress system itself systematically excluded most feminist and lesbian literature. They only allocated you know, taxpayers' dollars 
to produce talking book versions of things like the Bible, the Constitution, and as the Women's Bureau Press, um, one of their pamphlets puts it, the variety of books that would be found in a small town public library, most of which they didn't want to read. Um, they argued that literature plays a central role in the feminist movement of the 80s, and the ideas of feminism enabled many women to grow and make profound changes in their lives, end quote. So, um, exclusion had profound consequences, print, print, not exclusion from the Library of Congress system and also just exclusion from print. Um, and I also think that this group shows us that, um, you know, non-use, whether it's exclusion or um, um, other types of refusal can actually be technically productive. Non-users play a lot of roles other than just critique or resistance and often transform technical systems through their own access interventions. Um, or through the production of popular alternatives. So we see this with the cassette tape collective of the Women's Braille Press. We see this with talking books in general, which spurred the mainstream audiobook industry. Matt Rubery has written about this. We also, the, the, I don't have time to get into this, but talking books spurred the um, development of audio editing tools like time stretching. I'm writing a book on this with Jonathan Stern. Time stretching also was the precursor of auto-tune. And um, the last thing that I have thought about in terms of refusal in this group is just that exclusion or refusal can be a bottom up as well as a top down decision. It, it can be an activist tactic for security. Um, I, Crystal touched on this too, for privacy, for preservation. Um, and this is, it's not just structural. Um, and, you know, it, it, this kind of refusal is one that exceeds, of course, the category of blind lesbian separatism. It's common to many other groups. For, um, I'm thinking, for instance, of indigenous data sovereignty efforts. Um, and maybe how might, maybe I'll, I have a few other things that I could say about um, the tech industry today and op, the it real in, incredible difficulty of opting out. Crystal touched on some of these, so I could all, if we're out of, if I'm out of time, I could hold it for the Q&A. Yeah, let's, let's hold, let's, yeah. oh, I really want to hear it, so let's get to it in the Q&A, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, so maybe we'll move to Sarah and then circle into the Q&A as obviously we just have so much to talk about. Um, and I just want to also encourage everyone to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen so that we can incorporate your questions as well. But Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a difficult job to respond to so many uh, amazing points that have already been raised. And so I will, I will do my best. And I think maybe what helps um, is how drawn all of the panelists have been to the concept of refusal, the, the different functions it serves um, and for refusal, refusal specifically how it interacts with access. And so this also gives me a nice sort of springboard by which to react. Um, firstly, I think I just want to say that, like, I think that particularly in the context of my project, uh, refusal, I see as deeply, a deeply necessary part of racial justice work, um, both inside the context of looking at uh, technological applications, but also much broad, more broadly. Um, rather refusal of systems, structural exclusion, dehumanization, some of the things that Alex has already mentioned, but also the constant work uh, this takes. So the exhaustion doing this causes, uh, refusal in everyday life practices, particularly for those that make racial justice um, and also disability work, our day-to-day -day work. Um, and in, in this regard, I will want to say that a lot of our Just AI work, um, particularly in terms of our labs, has also been looking at the intersection between um, access and refusal. And particularly um, in our labs, the work of Caroline and, and, and uh, Erinma have really taught me at least a lot about how access can in many be ways be about refusal. So the refusal of compliance with the very sort of like exclusionarily defined ordinary functioning of things which are like definitely by design sort of constructed without and also in opposition to racialized and disabled people. Um, particularly I just wanted to pick up on this notion of like what are the functions of refusal that I think all of the speakers have spoken to. Um, I wanted to build on some of that, particularly in terms of what's coming up in my work, in terms of exploring how refusal can be a functioning way to look at how to look at AI um, systems and also policy that responds to AI systems. 
The first is that refusal in a policy space is also very much framed negatively. It's framed as sort of um, requiring non-action, requiring something to halt and stop. Um, but often then in these more institutional spaces, what we, what we miss then is also this like immense transformative um, and reimagining functions that come from the, the use of ref refusal. So not just being about non-use, um, but also like a fundamentally like fundamental basis of advocacy for alternatives. Um, and, and perhaps by uh, deploying refusal, what we do is do more to shift and transform um, than systems which seek to sort of uh, reform current systems, uh, particularly in a context of racial capitalism and innovation when halting becomes a very difficult task. Uh, with all the vested uh, levels of power involved in the deployment of uh, technology as in a corporate uh, sphere. The second function that I wanted to pick up on um, is how resisting a refusal is also being in direct opposition to this sort of enabling function that a lot of the AI, AI ethics space has in, for the most part um, fulfilled. So in effect, much of AI ethics has really been shown to see how they can implement corporate interests by either A, suggesting that there is a tech-based solution to every problem, and I think everyone has, has spoken to that already, and in many cases we are the problem, um, but also focusing on and how AI ethics enables in, in terms of how it focuses on mitigating improving and also further embedding sort of like carceral or surveillance based technologies rather than thinking about their abolition uh, what can happen in their space um, and moving towards transformative and community-led alternatives and i think all of us in our labs are reading and learning from the work of many many different abolitionist uh, thinkers particularly mariam kaba and i don't think we can have a conversation about refusal that doesn't that doesn't align with a lot of the uh, work on abolition that's been done particularly like black feminist uh, organizers particularly. The other thing that was really sh like struck me by the interventions was that um, a lot of the work um, in this space around refusal is also about design futures but fundamentally those new visions on design I think must be anti-capitalist because I don't think that we can expect the structure, structures of technology design that exist in our world today to, to reimagine um, a future that doesn't embed ableism, and capital, uh, ableism, capitalism and racism. This is, this is my thought and, I, and I, really, I really want to provoke the sort of need to explore sort of an anti-capitalist alternative vision of refusal that doesn't suggest that we can do design thinking in our existing structures and that will help us rewrite um, rewrite the ableist and racist structures of our world. And this is a really something that I think I would love to hear more from. Um, my main question, and I wanna leave this to back to the, the panelists is, I've been learning a lot about this as I already said in our labs and also learning from all of you, but I would wonder if we could elaborate a little bit more particularly for people that are less um, thinking about refusal, but particularly less thinking about refusal from the perspective of disability justice and the perspective of racial justice, is what is the intersection of these different refusal frameworks? Um, how do we see these different frameworks as complementary? How do we see refusal from a racial justice perspective as complementary from refusal uh, in disability rights? So at the beginning, Louise talked about like this notion of frictionless future and the idea we can write disability out in the future of des design. Do some of these similar thinkings relate to race? Are there some existing types of thinking that suggest that we can write race out, uh, but also people, queer people, trans people, racialized, disabled subjects, um, and how far does this, like, can, can this take us somewhere else as opposed to just framing us as problems to be solved? Um, particularly, and the reason I'm interested in this intersection is because I think we're going to have more and more practical policy sort of scenarios where 
refusal strategies of some groups are co-opted and undermined by um, like a corporate logic which divides and conquers different um, othered and oppressed communities. Like one particular example I'll give and then I'll, I'll end is that many of us working from a racial justice perspective on AI ethics and AI policy have really put forward the idea of that we need to um, dismantle the use of certain technologies and divest from certain technologies, particularly things like emotion recognition, particularly things like biometric categorization, because from our perspectives, they will continue the othering of us um, as subjects. Um, what we've seen from a lot of the corporate um, AI ethics um, community and also corporate um, arguments is that many of these uses um, from a disability perspective should be useful and therefore our strategies are exclusive from a disability perspective and actually these corporate technologies can help um, various problems as, as you've all outlined um, from a disability perspective. Now at least from my perspective this is a really sort of attempt to co-opt and uh, like use also many paternalistic discourses of disability but then also then we have this question of how far do that like do we undermine different practices of resistance if we're not taking into account this um, intersectional approach between how different forms of oppression combine so I think I hope that example sort of like made practical why I'm interested in specifically understanding a little bit more how the panelists think that um, disability justice and racial justice approaches to refusal can complement each other um, and the need to do that so that we can't essentially be exploited by not having a thought about these things together. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. This is uh, already so rich. Um, so I want to allow the panelists to respond to this um, really rich provocation that Sarah has just offered. Um, Mara, I feel like I cut you off a, a bit. Do you want to have the first response? Sure, I'll just say in, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really um, such a wonderful response. And I'm excited to know more about your work. Um, I'll just make one comment of like in answer to your question about um, refusal in the tech industry, specifically <laughs> thinking about corporations and not just about devices um, and, and how refusal is um, racialized in different ways. One example that's just been present on my mind quite a lot lately has to do with NDAs um, and tech workers. I also, I'm here in Texas doing work on the history of um, switchboard automation. And I've been thinking a lot about tech work, which is something I, we haven't really talked about yet on this panel. Um, um, tech work <laughs> is also a form of use. <laughs> tech work is, is the kind of work that a lot of um, um, increasing numbers of people do. and. Um, there, I, I, in the U.S. right now, there are a number of laws um, about that are including one in California called the Silenced No More Act that are trying to prevent tech companies from forcing workers to sign NDAs, non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreements, as a condition of employment. And um, these are basically you, it's similar to what Crystal was describing about not being able to opt out of knowing where one's data is being collected. These are all or nothing employment contracts that say if you don't sign them, you don't work, you don't have a job. And in, in signing these contracts, your non-disparagement means saying anything negative about your employer at all, with you know Pinterest, Facebook, et cetera, and whether it's tr anything true, it's not slander, it's saying something truthful. And this means that if you and people sign these just because they ha you have to get a job and later if you're um, faced with sexual harassment or racism and there have been a number of high profile cases around this lately in, in, in the tech industry, you're not allowed to talk about what happened to you and this allows like the continuation of um, of transphobia, ableism, racism, sexism to be just built into those industries because the people, the perpetrators are never named. Um, and the person is just either quits or is paid off and they're and they've they've signed a gag order at the beginning of their employment. So people like Ifioma Ozoma, who um, worked at Pinterest recently, broke her NDA and she's the and um, to talk about racism at Pinterest and 
you know, she, you can be countersued if you break an NDA. It's very risky to do that. And so she's the lead figure um, putting the Silence to No More Act forward. It's 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 almost on the governor's desk, and it'll be really transformative in terms of U.S. politics if that gets signed in, because California will then be the first state to have made it illegal to have these contracts as a condition of employment. So I just want to mention this as one example. There's there's also legislation in tech, by, you know promoted by tech corporations that utterly prevents people from refusing. Um, to sign certain things and from, from refusing to behave in a certain way in order to work at all. And basically to silence people from ever complaining um, <laughs> and being able to make social change. And it's, it's I, had, I had no idea this existed until a couple of years ago because I'm in a different field, but it's quite terrifying to think that people's silence is being on, on such a huge sweeping scale in the tech industry is being purchased and compelled. Thank you, Mara. Um, who would like to jump in? Alexa, maybe I could um, possibly respond to, to Sarah and possibly also to the Q&A question from Jenny. Um, so I, I was thinking about how these frameworks come together. And I think you know, that Sarah was inviting it towards the end of her um, response. And I, for me, they really are together. And I, I'm, I'm not going to, um, in this answer, really talk about capitalism, but for me, that is a central theme and hopefully we can come back to that. Um, but I, there are two things that I think are, um, are important for me. So. I really liked Crystal's phrase of the double bind. And I think um, in a way Mara's example, you know, outstanding example of the archive for me is an, ex an illustration of the double bind where the form of the archive, it's material form and it's digital. And in some cases the digit digitized forms of archives um, already determine the ways in which we can think. And I think you know, people like Sadia Hartman's work around arch archives is so important for me here. So the, the very organization and structure and language and what's made available through the archive dictate our ways, our modes of thinking. And I think it, that cuts through whether we're talking about uh, racial bodies or disabled bodies, etc. that cuts through all those. So I think that would be one way in which um, these things come together and you know, for those of us in science and technology studies and, and techno science, feminist techno science, um, that would be a familiar orientation to thinking about the materiality of, of technologies. I mean, and, and then the second thing that I think might enable this sort of combination or complementary set of frameworks is that these, the, the modes in which um, AI and machine learning are being largely used at the moment is this sort of monolithic or homogenous treatment of the body. It's as though we can be reduced to a series of enumerations um, and that if we are able to extract enough data from the body, we will create a generic model of everyone in their entirety. And I think um, though that, again, that kind of, um, deeply troubling view of what it is to be human is sort of being treated as, as this monolith. And that again is a thing that we could resist or refuse. Um, and I think there are, you know, there are some nice examples in which AI isn't being used like that. Um, but I suppose that's a conversation we can have that cuts across these frameworks of thinking about um, racial bodies and, and disabled bodies. I'm, I'll leave it there, I'm not sure I've, actually responded to to the question that was asked in the q a but hopefully we can come back to that yeah thank you i think this idea of the, the monolithic body is um, really important uh, let me read this question because it is such such a great question um, from jenny so thank you jenny so jenny says that um 
feeling particularly grateful for the conversation about the archive and the significance of an archive of refusal so that the refusals themselves are not obliterated or erased. Um, Jenny's question is to, to the panel is, what an archive of refusal might look like in the overweening, overpromising orientations of AI technological development with thanks there to Crystal for giving us this language to speak about this. Um, Crystal, do you, do you want to respond to this very interesting question? Yes, I guess so. I wanted to like pick up first uh, where Alex left off and then I'll try to get there. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so like, and then I'll also try to get to um, Sarah's um, point about like building solidarity. I, I anyways, I'm just gonna go. Um, so I think in terms of like Alex's point about like AI thinking about monolithic, uh, monolithic ideas about what the body should look like. I mean, I think I can probably be a little bit more explicit about like the connection between disability and AI in the sense that AI is essentially sexy stats. And what is stats, but like thinking about the regression to the mean, which has a really, really large foundation in eugenic science, where like people were, uh, Francis Galton in, this, uh, in particular was thinking about how to measure like moral and like physical deviance. And I think that's the kind of foundation of the system that we're talking about. So like eugenics is like quite literally the feature, not the bug. Um, but so like, Coming, like zooming back out to the point that um, Mara was talking about in terms of tech work and Sarah's point about building solidarity. I mean, I think all of these things are intertwined and I would be very hesitant to like kind of disaggregate them in the way that um, you describe. So basically, I'm agreeing with you that like we can't really disaggregate all of these different um, social justice approaches, um, particularly when so much of the tech work, as Mara mentioned, is about breaking the solidarity, like, right? Like I think NDAs are um, like leveraged and weaponized as a way to like break workers, uh, break, break worker power in the same way that like a lot of the union busting um, across um, organizations like Google, um, et cetera, have been kind of working about because um, I think like tech workers see themselves as somehow like not, uh, it, like see themselves as not being part of the like a, a blue collar worker system that would benefit from pr protection. And so I think there, there are lots of different elements about like unionization, labor justice, racial justice, gender um, and disability justice. I mean, I think all of these are intertwined and like there's so many multiply marginalized people like throughout all of these systems that I do think they really like uh, build on each other. And I think like to your examples, I think they're perfect ones like the biometric identification and like emotional identification. I think those were the two examples that you used. I mean, I think like the fact that they um, excessively and punitively target folks of color is not an accident. And I think that that also holds true for, you know, folks who are um, neurodivergent or um, thinking about different ways uh, that bodies are identified in biometric systems with like gate detection, for example, that like don't um, take into account like the possibility of wheelchair users. I mean, I think, I guess all this to say, like, I think that building solidarity and like integrating all of these um, approaches to social justice are really important and like mutually reinforcing and trying to think about how to do that more productively is something that I think the panel is really helping me think through. Thank you, Crystal. I know we have so many fascinating threads already <laughs> in play. Um, does anyone else want to pick up there? Mara, I, I yeah. just want to say I love the archive question, and I'm not sure I have an answer to it. And I, I you know, for this one collection, I completely trust the Lesbian History Archives, um, who have been doing this sort of thing for a really long time, um, to think through what to do with these tapes and to preserve the actual physical tapes, even though they've now been digitized. Um, I also just want to say I see so many friends and colleagues in the in the participant list who know a lot and have thought a lot about archiving. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. 
Dotkin and um, Grayson Brillmeyer is here and they're an amazing a person who theorizes um, disability and, and queerness and transness in archives. And I have a feeling there's a lot of collective <laughs> wisdom and people here who know more than I do. Um, I, you know, I presented as a, I would like to someday write about this collection, but I'm just sort of going back and forth with the archivist at the Lesbian History Archive and Marge Schneider, who founded the collection, and some of my blind friends and some of my blind lesbian friends trying to figure out how to do it, but I, I don't have an answer right now. I just, I love the, this, I love the provocation about preserving refusal. And I think that's super important. And I've written it and taken a note about it. And, and thank you, Jenny, for mentioning that. Um, I just want to jump in here. Sorry, Alec, were you going to say something? No, please, Louise, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it's really interesting um, that you bring up Cynthia Hartman's work. Um, lose your mother and I was really struck by that text in a way that as you go into the opening section of that book it really is about the lives that uh, Cynthia Hartman cannot document. She has to, she talks about the responsibility of having to do that work as a kind of historian, a kind of thinker. And I was thinking about how, you know, um, Mara had talked about this in your archive, and now archives seem to be kind of a, a kind of thread that's really significant here. But, you know, taking this back to kind of Sarah's um, work and proposition and our ongoing conversation, I'm really struck by where do we turn to as researchers, as like, what do we do with that refusal? Like, or how do we, in, in the case of Sylvia Hartman, where she talked about the responsibility of documenting lives that are not in the archives, right? So you have to, in some ways, you have to kind of imagine or you have to kind of enlive them. And so I wonder, you know, as researchers and people working in this area, like there's a tendency to set responsibility um, as the kind of horizon. But I guess what is the, the other horizon is perhaps a, an anti-capitalist one. But I was just wondering if, uh, if anybody like to build on that or um, we can move on and hold this. Louise, I, can I connect that to a question that just came in? And there's great questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. We're going to try, try. I see them. We're going to try to weave them in. But there's a question here about um, how human rights-based approaches have been looked at as one po possibility, but what may also be the limitations of those approaches. So just to sort of tag that on to the question that you've raised, Louise. Can I follow up on, I think, Louise's point? And, and um, well, may, maybe uh, both Jenny and Raquel's points. Um, what, I, what I really take from Sadia Hartman's work is this sort of trying to imagine the impossible when, when it's been written out of the archive. Um, and, it, it, you know, as Louise has said, it's a, Lose Your Mother is such a powerful book that that invites us to imagine the impossible. Um, and so I think in terms of what an archive of refusal might be, it might be to leave those spaces open. Um, and so rather than this kind of homogenous, monolithic idea of, of completeness, that can we complete the idea of humanity or the idea of the human, it's an incompleteness and a heterogeneity of the human that becomes interesting. So, you know, an archive of refusal might be you know, many more modes of imagining what the human might be that are forever, forever incomplete, if you will. Um, and I think the, ooh, one of the questions I wanted to answer has disappeared. Um, uh, where else? Um, so that the, the question of infrastructures um, that's, that's in the Q&A. So this is a question about whether, you know, we're able to think infrastructurally about these rather than specific cases. Um, I think these are, in a way, these are exemplary cases of an infra infrastructural thinking. I mean, I did like Mara's point that, you know, as, as well as infrastructure, we're thinking about 
bottom up, um, you know, grassroots movements as well. Although I think those things are sort of, if you like, the same side of, of, of the same coin. Um, but I, I think for me, this is an infrastructural mode of thinking. I'm always drawn to the phrase, you know, Foucault's use of the conditions of possibility that have been taken up in feminist techno science. That, um, you know, we're we're building conditions of for thinking with, um, and that, you know, things like Mara's archival work are exemplary cases of how we begin to create new conditions for thinking in. Um, and I, I see that as a, as a kind of structural question. And I'm not sure if that, that answers Raquel's point specifically, but hopefully to some extent. Thank you, and sorry about that. I, I dismissed the question, <laughs> a little technical difficulty. Um, so maybe I can introduce here a really interesting question um, about infrastructure. So this is Raquel uh, writes about a curiosity about the interstices and borderlands and thinking with infrastructure studies. So much of the conversation about refusal seems to focus on specific artifacts and technologies. Um, infrastructures of various types, though, can feel a little more porous. How do we think about the spaces that are both working toward access and also still frictional? What does refusal look like in the context of infrastructures that become so foundational? Does anyone want to speak to that? I think, Sarah, did I see you nodding? I, I can say something very briefly, but I, actually, I think it really... Um... I was nodding because it was also reminding me kind of a little bit about what Crystal was saying earlier about like the the dominance of of tech companies and 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 particularly like what does it mean to actually refuse um, systems which have become basically become in some ways very close to omnipotent right like essentially we can a lot of I agree with the question I think it's a really good question that a lot of conversation around refusal, at least as I see in, a, in the racial justice space, has looked at like different applications of technology, particularly because it's a very community-based um, practice that we're talking about, right, which makes a lot of sense. Um, we, we were going to exercise refusal in our community and in particular use cases where that we see affect us. Um, however, then thinking to the point of the relevance to the tech space, indeed not a lot of the conversation and again a lot of the focus of the AI ethics space has been about use cases but not about infrastructures again coming back to this question about capitalism even the whole AI you could say that even the whole AI debate is a red herring for what it should be a conversation about infrastructures um, I've learned a lot from the work of Seda Gerses in this space who has basically taught me that actually, yes, we can talk about bias, we can talk about discriminatory outcomes, we can talk about how certain technologies are not accurate or appropriate for differently constructed bodies, differently constructed identities, that's one thing. But if we don't deal with the fact that almost every AI system, every new technological development has to come through an infrastructural process, which is essentially uh, governed by one of eight companies, then we're talking about a very different question here, not just about access, not just about discrimination, but also centralization of power. Um, and I have absolutely no answer to how we, how we address that. But again, I think it comes back to this question about, we talk about intersectionality in an in intersectionality approach in very much a frame of identity, but that fundamentally has to address centralization and capitalist anti-capitalist approaches too. Um, I like this question on infrastructure because what I'm doing for two weeks right now in San Antonio is going through these papers in the AT&T archives here about switchboard automation, which has become this it started in the 19 teens <laughs> it sounds really distant but it's become a, a, a present in a lot of ai researchers minds because it's seen as one of the probably the first full-scale automation of an electronics industry 
And um, like the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States has, I was surprised to see that those folks who I don't usually converse with have been looking back at telephone operators to see what happened to those people when, when the full infrastructure changed, what happened to those laborers as a way to predict what might happen to laborers and in other industries when a, an industry is automated. And their conclusion was basically that lots of people lost their jobs and they never recovered and weren't able to get back into another job market if they were of a certain age. So it's been, I decided to come here and see what was happening in the 19 teens. And the first thing I would say is automation takes a really long time. It took from the 19 teens to 1960 for telephone switchboards to be fully automated, meaning that you would use a dial or push button phone rather than talk to an operator. And so you know, the myth of a revolution, an automation revolution is not true. And there's a lot of time to make changes and to protest and to investigate and to watch and to interview people. It's a slow, I mean, it's probably a faster process now, but it's a slow process overall. Um, but it is true that like it's infrastructural change is harder it's harder to refuse because when, in you know, one can, one could refuse certain aspects device wise, thinking about the, the question um, of like the telephone system. But when the, the whole infrastructure changes, if you don't get on board, you don't have a telephone. And there were lots, there's lots of letters from disabled people who couldn't use the dial phone for different reasons, who missed being able to like just talk to an operator and have the operator place the call for them. But that was then gone. And of course, all the laborers, unless they were all the laborers who were fired, didn't like the change either, but they had no choice. So infrastructural change can be sweeping. It can be almost impossible to refuse, but it's it's a slow process. And that means that there's it's if you're if we're paying attention to it as it's happening, uh, one, you know, one interventions can be made along that path. Thank you, Mara. Um, unbelievably, we're almost out of time. This has just been a fabulous conversation. So I'm going to pass to Louise to close, but I certainly hope we will find other ways to continue this, this conversation. Um, I want to thank all the panelists, but I also got a message from Hannah in, in the panel saying that there's, whenever there's a, a panel on access, there's always so many links. And so I want to kind of thank everyone that's here today as a kind of collective practice of kind of just keeping an eye on the chat and adding links. And so I, that brings me a lot of joy that we do that for each other. Um, I also want to thank the captioner today, Wendy, who was actually a recommendation from one of the just AI fellows, um, uh, Elmer and Caroline, the for nation. So again, it's um, train, kind of paying um, tribute to kind of thinking about access and making the um, access infrastructure um, more visible. And of course, and we're, we're in the middle of a panel on the future, the kind of visual, the visualization of um, intimacy had its complexities and contradictions. But I want to thank everyone today, and I'm really excited to connect with everyone on the panel today and in the audience, and perhaps think of ways that we can continue this conversation as a working group. So thank you, everyone, and it was great to be here with you today. Thank you, Alexa, for moderating too, and Sarah responding. I'm just going to get gushy, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. What a joy to have this conversation.